All right, folks, we are here in the catacombs, the bowels, if you will, of the Joe Lewis Arena in Detroit, Michigan, where The Undertaker has just defeated Hulkamania. And you, Mr. Bear, you have declared that Hulkamania, as we know it, is now dead. Oh, yes, Mean Gene. Oh, yes, Hulkster will not pose anymore. He has gone on to another life. But the services are not finished. They will end right here tonight in Texas. Oh, yes, where my undertaker will deliver last rites. Oh, yes, you big yellow tan and red motherfucker, you. (laughs) Oh, man. That's so good. You know, it's fun that we're watching this too, because we just recently, most of us at least had a chance to catch uh, Steve Austin talking to the undertaker here on the network. And they talk so much about the early days of the undertaker. And this is really shitting and getting as a reminder, the undertaker beat Hulk Hogan for the world title. I'll take a look at this. Look into the coffin, Mr. Okerlund. It's phenomenal. What a great shot. Very well done here. They're talking about, you know, Hulkamania being in this coffin from survivor series. Of course we've covered survivor series, 1990 in our archives. Be sure to check that out at something to wrestle.com. But one year later, one year after the debut of the character, he beats Hulk Hogan for the world title, which is really only an honor that had been bestowed to one other man, the ultimate warrior back at WrestleMania six in 1990. So, you know, you, you roll through those championship years, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. And the first major loss that Hogan suffers for the title, you know, besides the whole dispute with, uh, the double referee thing on NBC is a pinfall loss to the ultimate warrior. And now again, here in 1991 with the undertaker and man, look at this. What a great treat. I feel bad that we're talking over gorilla monsoon and Bobby, the brain. This is my favorite duo of WWF commentators in history. I think it's a lot of people's favorite duo. You know, you go back and for old time fans, it was either Jesse and Vince or Bobby and gorilla. I mean, I really enjoyed gorilla and, and, and Jesse as well, but there's something about Bobby Heenan that especially, I think there is a, a whole group of guys who are like my age. And we've just sort of grown into appreciating the greatness of Bobby Heenan, you know, that maybe we didn't pick up on as a kid because we were just cheering for our favorites. But as an adult, man, you can't help, but look at what this guy was doing and think nobody was at his level. No, Bobby was, I think amongst his peers as well, longtime fans. They have always looked at Bobby Heenan as being the greatest manager of all time. And no one living today, in my opinion, would dispute that from a working standpoint and just being able to get talent over his own as a heel. He was able to get baby faces over in a big way by putting them over and knocking them at the same time, knocking them in a negative, positive way. That it was an art form for someone that truly got it. Bobby was a master of that. By the way, once upon a time, another famous, very tall wrestler would say that he made dragging the belt to the ring famous long before Steve Austin. I think the undertaker has something to say about that because here he comes dragging the belt to the ring. And we've talked about, you know, how you got him into the company and, and your whole idea and the, just the development of this character. And one year later, here he is. This is a guy who talked about on Steve Austin's podcast on the WB network, the broken skull sessions, which I highly recommend. Uh, it should have been called dead man talking, but whatever, um, that he wasn't sure what they were going to do with this character and, and, and wasn't sure what, how he was going to be, what his character was going to be. He had been mean Mark Callis for the NWA and WCW and, um, Ollie Anderson famously told him you, nobody will ever buy a ticket to see you wrestle. And now here he is as the undertaker and he has the top belt 
in the entire industry worldwide without question in December of 1991 and has the distinction of being one of two guys to beat Hulk Hogan for the belt. The other being the ultimate warrior who's no longer here. Of course he was sent home after SummerSlam 91. You see the fans going wild here, but this match is not without controversy. Of course, at SummerSlam or survivor series, rather when Hulk Hogan is up in the tombstone position, the undertaker is ready to pile drive him, drop him on his own head. As they say, Ric Flair sneaks in, slides a folding chair underneath, and, and it makes that pile driver even more devastating. Not just a regular tombstone, but a tombstone on a chair. And I can't believe this is real, but uh, Dave Meltzer actually wrote about this in The Observer and said, Flair then put a chair in the ring and Undertaker gave to a Hogan a tombstone pile driver on the chair for the pin. When watching the show, I thought the best work of the entire show was Hogan selling the tombstone after the match was over. It took him several minutes to get to his feet and he looked really groggy and his selling was completely realistic. As it turns out, he was really injured, apparently by the tombstone on the chair. After viewing it back several times, it does appear that Hogan's head never came near the chair. However, Undertaker may have jammed Hogan's neck with his knee since Hogan was hospitalized legit all night long with a jammed neck. Yeah. I think, and I could be wrong, but I believe the rumor and innuendo is that the Undertaker, being a relatively young guy in the business and really excited and proud to have this opportunity just one year in the company after being told a year prior you'd never sell a ticket in the business, he flew his whole family to Survivor Series to see this big pay-per-view, to see this big match against Hulk Hogan because he knew the creative, oh my God, I'm beating Hulk Hogan on pay-per-view for the World Wrestling Federation title. And there's a little bit of a stink on the title win because afterwards Hogan legitimately, allegedly feigns an injury and goes to the hospital. And when he watched the replay back to Meltzer's point, he's nowhere near the chair, but Hogan that night convinced everyone, no, he's legitimately hurt and went to the hospital and it sort of put a stink on the title win of the big proud moment for the real life Mark Calloway. And I don't know that Ho that Hogan and undertaker ever really saw eye to eye ever again, according to the rumor and innuendo you, you weren't there, but you, you were around both of these guys for a long time. Tell me what you heard about survivor series 91 and what you remember about this match in particular with maybe that being the underlying heat between the two. Uh, I heard all that and I watched it back several times and it looked like, uh, that Taker probably could have gotten run over by a Mack truck. And he had such a tight hold of Hogan that there was nothing that was going to happen to Hulk. Um, it is could, what it is. And it couldn't have looked safer is the point. And when you go yeah, back to me you, yeah. and, and to Taker, and I think that it was, I think that knowing Taker, he would never, ever intentionally hurt anybody. And certainly he was going to be extra careful that night with the Hulk golden Hogan. Goose. The and, golden goose. you know, it looked good to me. By the way, look at the tremendous work of the Undertaker here, doing the choke and rolling his eyes back into his head. If you haven't yet, I can't believe I'm advocating this because I wanted so desperately at StarCast to have you get dragged these stories out of the Undertaker. It wasn't to be, but... The, the broken skull session, which I can't put over enough. When you're done with this, go watch that on the W network. It's phenomenal. Undertaker talked about how, when he became this undertaker character, he had to sort of change the way he thought about wrestling, what he could do and what he should do became two different things. Yes. He can run the ropes real fast and jump real high for clotheslines, but would the undertaker do that? And you really saw the undertaker as a character and Mark Calloway as a performer doing the undertaker come into his own in this first year, because you see how slow and methodical and almost Michael Myers and Jason, you know, the, the real horror movie film franchises, you see how slow he's working. You go back and watch him as mean Mark Callis. 
totally different presentation. He's clicking on all cylinders here. Is he not? Absolutely. And it, that just goes to, to the talent of Mark and just how good he really was that he was able to adapt. And we took all of the things that he did extraordinarily well, and we would incorporate them into the match at the right point. Suddenly. So he would work very methodically and slow, but when it was time, just like in a movie, he's on you. Exactly. And he would turn it up and you'd go, holy fuck. Where did that come from? That's what made him so dangerous. And that's what made him so appealing to the audience. This is such a phenomenal, you know, pay-per-view to me because it, I was at maybe the peak of my fandom here from a WWF standpoint, because I couldn't believe somebody finally beat Hulk Hogan, um, in real life. And I know I'm probably putting you in a spot here to betray some confidence as a peek behind the curtain, but that's the format of the show. Do you believe the undertaker had some animosity to Hulk Hogan for a certain period of time? Maybe not today, but once. Yeah, time. definitely. Yeah, I think he did. I think that, you know, in, in his, to him, this was the biggest moment of his career. And, and, um, I think that, yes, he did. So. The undertaker's contention is that Hogan wasn't really hurt and he was quote unquote working and shitting on his big moment. I mean, do you believe that? I don't your- I, uh, see. I don't think that Hulk was shitting on his moment. I just think that, you know, whatever happened, happened. And again, not being there, I've never talked to Hulk about it. So I, I don't know. Um, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to believe that about Hulk because I mean, you've talked about this before with other interesting polarizing characters in wrestling. I tend to treat people the way they treat me. And he's always been, and I'm talking about the, I mean, Hulk Hogan. So cool to me. I can't imagine that he would be intentionally shitty to anyone. Right. I understand that in the course of business, sometimes business is business, pal. Goddamn. I get it. Whatever. Um, but it doesn't feel like something Hogan would do unless, and we've talked about this before, you know, when. When Owen Hart kicked Shawn Michaels in the back of the head, Shawn Michaels went to the hospital that night and faked injuries and worked the hospital. And guys, the NWA did that too, where they felt like it was necessary to sort of keep kayfabe. So on the one hand, maybe you think, well, Hogan's just trying to keep kayfabe and really sell the angle that the only way Hulkamania could really get beat is if he legitimately injured him. But really the worst or maybe one of the worst, one of the two worst things that a wrestler can do is earn a reputation as being dangerous as someone who's not going to take care of you, someone who will hurt you. And, and, and to have a little bit of that stink on the undertaker character, just one year in not good. Right. Yeah. And I don't believe that, that there was, I really and truly don't believe that anybody thought that he was dangerous in any way, shape or form. Did you ever hear, again, nobody told me this. I'm just asking questions to my friend. Did you hear of Vince admonishing the undertaker after the match? Or, I mean, was he cutting a promo on him? Like, how could you? God damn it. You've killed the golden goose or whatever in real life. No, no conversation like that happened. Nope. Okay. Nope. Not at all. And I think that they, they watched it best of my knowledge that they watched it back and went, okay. Let's go find out what happened. But, um, I don't think that anybody, anybody thought that Taker was dangerous by any stretch of the imagination. We should mention that, uh, Meltzer was freestyling in the newsletter that Dale Wilkes was probably going to wind up coming here. Um, do you remember you were at least friendly with Dale? Do you remember Dale being discussed as a, as a possibility of coming in here? Cause we wouldn't see him here for what, like six years. No, uh, I don't know because I hadn't even started it. I knew Dell from his stormtrooper days in AWA when we had reached out to him before, but, um, I hadn't even started in global yet. Right. Global yet. So Dell was still, still doing well in, in global. And it was actually, well, that was ugly. Um, it was actually at, it was this evening. Um, in Texas that I got the phone call from Paul Heyman telling me that Eddie Gilbert was taking the book in global and wanted to bring me in after the first of the year. 
do you immediately run to Vince and say, by the way, I just got an offer to do this. Do you want to hire me now? No, he had already told me I wasn't coming back. Uh. 